Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Streamline Your Infusion Device Testing. My name is Edna Johnson with Fluke Biomedical, and welcome to today's session. Before we get started, I would like to go over some housekeeping items. Everyone other than the panelists are muted during the webinar. During this session or any time throughout the presentation, please use the questions window on the right panel to submit your requests. We will try to answer all questions. However, if we're not able to get to your request, send us an email and we will get it answered for you. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive information about how to gain access to the recorded session and a follow-up email. Now, I will turn it over to Dan and the team. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Edna. This is Dan Wold from Fluke Biomedical, and I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for joining us. And as we continue our educational webinar series, these webinars are, uh, you're, you're eligible to get one CE credit from ACI. And, uh, and I wanna remind you that uh, all webinars are available on demand on the Fluke Biomedical website. So you could go get uh, a, another credit for watching other webinars as well. You just go to flukebiomedical.com, Knowledge Center, and then webinars. And uh, the available webinars for credit uh, are there to, to view. So for today's webinar, um, we have a few, uh, we have three simple steps to, to get your certificate. And First of all, you need to attend the presentation up to a minimum duration, you know, up to the Q&A, at least through the educational content. But we do want to remind you, stay through that Q&A session because a lot of great questions will, will come about from the webinar. And uh, you want to make sure you're here to, to, to listen to some of those questions because um, it'll, it'll be great uh, information for you to, to take onto your team. After the webinar, within 24 to 48 hours, you'll receive an email from Fluke Biomedical with a link to a survey that you'll fill out. And then uh, once you fill out that survey, you'll be able to download your certificate. Well, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to uh, Jerry Zion and Michael Raich. Take it away. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so thank you all for joining today's webinar uh, on streamlining your infusion device testing. Uh, our two presenters today are going to be myself, Michael Rach. Uh, I'm the senior portfolio manager here at Fluke Biomedical, so I take care of all of our products that we currently sell um, and make sure that they get into the hands of our customers like you on the phone today. Uh, and Jerry, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jerry Zion. I'm the global technical training manager for all of Fluke Health Solutions, including Fluke Biomed and Raysafe. And I'm, uh, I'm proud to join again with my good friend, Mike, um, to help you understand a little bit more about streamlining your infusion device testing. Yeah, no, it should be a great discussion. And to kind of frame up what we're gonna go through today, um, I wanna briefly touch on kind of the three big areas. Um, the first thing we're going to touch on is why infusion device testing is important. Uh, and then we'll jump into kind of the how, right? So we'll be looking at the procedure to test an infusion device <clears throat> and then also look into uh, your strategy and how you can streamline it, right? So this is where we're going to get into uh, some of the improvements you can make to your current procedure. But at the base of everything that uh, Fluke Biomedical does, we believe that it's important uh, to really build a good foundation. Um, so the first thing I want is to make sure that the entire group here on the phone understands what an infusion device is. Um, and the device, uh, the definition we have up here on the screen is a medical device that delivers fluids such as nutrients and medications into a patient's body in controlled amounts. Um, and, you know, that's under the, the guise of, of infusion pump, but there's these infusion devices are the most numerous uh, or, or, you know, common devices in the hospital. Uh, and they take various different forms, be it an IV pump, a syringe pump, uh, a PCA pump, a drip counter. Um, but in general, 
all of those devices seek to do the same thing. Um, what they're trying to do is control flows, volumes, and pressures um, to make sure that they're accurate and that they prevent any over or underdose to the patient. But the other thing that they, they seek to do is maintain that continuous operation. You never want any interruption of your flow volume or pressure uh, to a patient. Um, and Jerry, I think you had a point that you wanted to make about how critical this is to patients. Yeah, so, I mean, it's easy for us to all think, look, you know, most of these infusion devices are put into the hospital's inventory on the basis of contracts for the purchase of the infusion, the infusates, that is the fluids that are, um, main fluids that are delivered as well as um, the infusion sets. But in truth, they are, they deliver critical um, medications such as opioids, which are narcotics, which again, you don't want to overdose because for example, um, the if you overdose um, a, a pain reliever like uh, Curari, which is a, has a different name, you can compromise the patient's breathing um, drivers. And when you do that, they will, they will die from asphyxiation. They won't be able to get oxygen in because they won't be breathing. The, um, the, the, another more important one is in cancer therapy, the chemotherapy drugs are infused uh, by these devices. And again, if you underdose the chemotherapy, the cancer doesn't get killed. If you overdose the chemotherapy, you kill the patient too, which is not what we're seeking to do. So the accurate delivery and consistent delivery without problems are what we're trying to make sure happen with all of these. And so that includes their safety mechanisms like um, the downstream occlusion, like detection of air bubbles in the, in the, infus in the infusate lines, so these are all important things that we're going to want to cover and, and look at um, when we do the testing of these devices. No, absolutely. And Jerry, did you want to walk us through kind of the different technologies that are out there? Yeah, so there are several. Um, there are, um, we'll call them peristaltic actions, which can be a roller pump. Uh, where the roller is actually kind of pushing the fluid through the tubing, or there's like, they call them fingers, and you can see those in the, in the left-hand illustration to the right side of it. And those kind of massage the fluid through the tubing to get it to be delivered. And those are important mechanisms. They're pretty common uh, across all infusion pumps. And then there's the syringe method, the syringe pump, which has actually got a, a mechanical, very accurate screw, um, threaded screw that drives the, um, the, the uh, piston of the, of the infusion of the syringe to deliver very accurately the amount of infusate held within the syringe. So these are used, for example, for um, uh, um, uh, the kinds of medications that we use for conscious IV conscious sedation um, and uh, and some other things that need to be very accurately delivered in small volumes. So obviously the syringe has a limited volume. Uh, and this would be inclusive of some PCA pumps are uh, are the a syringe pump type. Yeah, and there are a couple other technologies out there. Um, well, I don't know if we can call gravity a technology, but drip counters, right? Oh, That's right. That's another thing we touched on. Um, they don't really control anything. They just count the drips, mm -hmm. um, and that's gravity fed. Um, so that's another technology. Um, and then cassettes and PCA pumps, Jerry, did you want to touch on those? Well, cassettes, I haven't seen cassettes and PCA pumps much, but I have seen cassettes in, for example, the plum 
uh, model of infusion pump, and it's a, a little cassette that has like a little piston in it that actually is kind of an on-off mechanism. So periodically it will pull open the, the valve and then close it, pull it open and close it. And so those are kind of an intermittent action. They're not a continuous flow action, but those also need to be evaluated and, um, and you need a device that can actually, uh, actually make that measurement accurately as well. Yeah, and on PCA pump, I was I was saying it as an and, but um, just to define that, you know, it's a patient-controlled analgesia pump. So that's where the patient it, it themselves controls the flow of pain medication into their body. Right, um, and so it releases within, the medicine into them within limits. And so, of course, the key safety mechanism in a PCA pump is the lockout time. That is, as the patient gives themselves an extra dose of their pain medication, there is a lockout time to prevent them from overdosing themselves by continuously pushing for more, more, more. And that lockout time must work. Otherwise the patient will overdose themselves. So that's a, a safety mechanism specific to PCA or patient controlled analgesia pumps. You won't find that on any other pump. Yeah, and Jerry, you alluded a little bit towards, you know, what can go wrong uh, with a couple of these examples. Um, but do you mind walking us through the through this slide? Sure. So the biggest, most, no, most problematic one is false alarms um, to begin with. That is an alarm that happens because perhaps not enough care was given in in getting all of the air bubbles out of the infusion set tubing before it was placed in the infusion pump and the infusion uh, had begun. Um, and those, uh, those are a nuisance to the nursing staff um, because they interrupt the delivery of the medication and they require uh, the personal attention of the nurse to clear those bubbles and and reset the um, uh, restart the infusion. Also, alarm failures can lead to injury, and they do happen, although they are not uh, very often where the alarm fails to sound. The biggest alarm, the most important alarm in general infusion pumps, is the occlusion alarm, and it's looking for downstream occlusion mostly, but there are also upstream occlusions it will detect. And in the case of the downstream occlusion, it can cause the, the it is caused typically by the needle um, that is in the vessel, the blood vessel of the patient, migrating and poking through the side of that blood vessel and sending the infusate into adjacent tissue. That will cause a swelling and indeed a back pressure to begin. And the idea is that it's a safety feature to prevent tissue damage because of pushing fluid in into the tissue as opposed to into the blood vessel for distribution throughout the body. So um, if that alarm fails and the pump fails to stop pumping, which are both part of that mechanism, then the patient is in trouble again. So again, another safety feature that we will seek to evaluate and make sure it's working properly during the testing. Free flow of fluid would, uh, may happen or syringe siphoning may happen. These are much less frequent problems. Um, free flow of fluid means there isn't any control. It's just flowing based on gravity, uh, whether or not it should, and there is no, no, nothing is happening to uh, cause it to stop. So we don't want any of that to happen. Air embolism would happen if the air in the infusate tubing actually migrated through the needle and into the blood vessel in sufficient size of the air bubble that it would block off blood flow uh, to a critical um, um, uh, a, a critical and vital organ. So we don't want that to happen. It can happen. Again, it is very rare. Uh, air embolism can cause a uh, stroke and it can cause cardiac arrest um, if it is delivered into 
uh, uh, in 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 a way that causes the blood to be blocked, blood flow to be blocked. Incorrect readings are much more likely, and they can be a malfunction of software. Uh, and can lead to over or under dose of drugs. And that has happened also, if you look in the US FDA um, incident reports, um, that is their corrective actions. You can find those on the US FDA website. They're free and available to anybody. Um, so you will find some of those if you wanna read about them. Yeah, and in general, you know, these pump failures, we really have to pay attention to all these different types and prevent them. Um, because a couple times, as Jerry's been talking, um, they can lead to patient death. Um, so really, really critical pieces of uh, medical devices here um, that do connect to a patient. So it is important to keep that in mind. Exactly. Well, there used to be a problem, especially years ago when I entered Biomed, where we received these infusion devices and our, and our belief was that we could ignore them because they didn't belong to the hospital. They were put in under the the infusate and uh, syringe uh, and infusion set contract, but that's not true. And therefore they must be paid attention to, they must be tested and we'll go through a little bit more about that shortly. Yes, and before we do, we wanted to hop over to our uh, first poll question. Um, and Jerry, why don't you take us through the question uh, and we'll get it set up for the audience to answer. Sure, so the question is how often should you test infusion devices delivering narcotics, analgesics, that is pain relievers, and chemotherapy? Now, so the question is not just how often should you test infusion devices, but how often should you test those that deliver these much more critical and very potent medications to the patient? Is it annually, that would be once per year? Is it twice per year? Is it uh, four times per, per year every quarter? or is it every month? All right, so it looks and like the poll is open. Up. It's open, thanks Mike. And we will give participants about 30 seconds to enter their response. And the responses are coming in. And we will close the poll and okay. And the poll is now closing. I'll share the results. So 36% indicated annually, 21% indicated twice per year, 14 came in at um, every quarter, and then 29% indicated monthly. Wow, the monthly crowd must not have very many infusion pumps, and that may be true outside the United States or in maybe a, a, a small clinic or something uh, uh, in the rest of the world. But typically, there are far too many infusion devices to be able to accomplish a monthly test, and that 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 may be um, that may be sad, but um, but there are other ways to get around it. So. Um, Basically, the manufacturers uh, in their brand and model specific test procedures in the service manual of the infusion pumps typically re, uh, recommend that you test the infusion devices annually, no matter what in, in medications that are flowing. However, as you will see later in this presentation, we recommend that you double check that against your experience and your understanding of how infusion devices are used in your hospital or if you're an independent service provider in your client sites. And make sure that if you can possibly segregate those that are delivering narcotics, analgesics, and chemotherapy, um, that you consider that they may need to be tested more than once per year but base it on your own assessment, based on your own information and experience with those devices. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Yeah, <clears throat> well, thanks, Jerry. So first, we kind of wanted to walk through some general test recommendations. Um, and the first one, 
Jerry touched on in terms of, you know, those uh, analgesics that are more potent um, and things like that. But in general, right, we want to test our infusion pumps annually. Um, this is something that we want to keep in mind, um, not just about narcotics or things that could cause patients to stop breathing, breathing, um, but, you know, do push those, those lines of thought in terms of, am I testing it enough? Should I be testing it more frequently? Um, do apply a critical mindset um, to that. And especially second, those safety yeah. functionalities in the infusion device, especially those um, including the accuracy, but you know those those uh, things like the downstream occlusion uh, alarm and um, the mechanism, the functionality that causes the infusion pump to stop pumping. And if mm -hmm. it's a PCP pump, of course, the a lockout time to make sure that lockout time is also functioning properly. Yeah, and when as you go from device to device, you know, do follow the manufacturer's instructions. Um, each brand and model of device, each type of infusion device is different. Um, so do lean on the manufacturer to tell you what to test, to what limits, and uh, how frequently. Um, if you don't uh, have a manual that states how often to do your testing, uh, do a risk analysis. Uh, we have a couple of examples um, on our website in various places, um, but do think about, do determine a test frequency and a test procedure. Uh, and follow it. The best place to start from is the manufacturer. Um, the second best place to, to go from is, like Jerry said, your experience, right? Um, a lot of it is around having a procedure and following it um, to make sure that those patients remain safe. Anything to add on that, Jerry? Um, no, you're going to come to the next, next thing on, uh, on your next two bullets. Yeah. <clears throat> so where the manufacturer's instructions come from is ultimately from uh, the standards, right? So this standard is the IEC 60601-2-24, and the manufacturer service manual is going to be derived from this, um, from the international requirements, um, and it will be kind of, you know, uh, filtered down into what's relevant to you, to that medical device, um, and to that company. Um, that's why the manufacturer's instructions are what we tell you to follow. So as a backup, you can always go all the way up to the standard, but it's going to have a lot of stuff in there that might not be relevant to your specific uh, medical device. Um, so that's one, one place where, um, you know, your procedures can come from. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, follow your hospital's protocols as well. Um, the manufacturer's instructions, that's a good place to start. Um, do remember that you can always do more, right? If you have to do some sort of disinfection, document that, right? Um, and do it based on what your hospital's experience is. Um, there, there's always a good a good place to start with the the service manual, but don't don't forget that you can always do more uh, than what's required of you, um, especially if that helps you ensure patient safety. And the last point uh, in terms of recommendations is to document your results. Um, pass fail is great, um, but being able to write down the actual measurement result uh, allows you to have better audit defense, allows you to have better traceability to the manu to the uh, the infusion device, and also you know to see how it's trending over time. And you know Documenting those results on pen and paper is one thing, but if you can move that into a digital record, it's just that much safer uh, in case of a natural disaster um, or, you know, papers being misplaced uh, or filed away incorrectly. Um, just having that digital copy is a lot uh, is a lot more helpful, especially when you think about that um, audit defense point, right? Um, if someone came and asked you a question about your medical device, how quickly could you find it? Could you find it? Right, and then what is the uh, level of fidelity of that information? How much and, detail is there? And not just on audit, but medical legal liability as well. That means what happens when the patient's family gets a lawyer and sues the hospital about what they consider to be an injury or wrongful death. That happens a lot in the United States and more and more in Western European countries, but it is also happening everywhere in the world. Documenting your results 
and doing your testing, performing your testing uh, according to your to your uh, frequency of inspection um, is really helps you in, in in the medical legal responsibility as well. Your hospital may, I mean, these um, settlements and the the court uh, um, delivered verdicts uh, are very hurtful and can close the hospital. No, it's a very important point point there, the medical legal aspect as well. So with that, I want to jump into procedure, right? Um, and what tests should really be included? Because when you think about uh, an infusion device, uh, it's not just uh, the performance of that infusion device. Um, it's also the electrical safety. These are plugged into the wall or battery powered. We have to make sure that they're not just performing the way that they should, but that they are safe to use as well. Um, so in terms of your procedure, you should be looking out for uh, the requirement to do a visual inspection, right? This might be looking at the filters. This might be looking for cracks. Um, this might be looking for the uh, all the accessories to be there. Um, whatever your facility requires, make sure those are documented. That's part of the procedure. Um, once you document it, uh, it does require that everyone in the facility follows that and does it every single time. Uh, so it really does help you know, prevent uh, future maintenance, um, but also prevents those calls that, hey, something's missing. Um, so do try and work that in as much as you can. Uh, the second point I made was, which was electrical safety, right? So make sure that, you know, you're checking that the device is safe to use both for patients, but also for operators. Um, so you can look at things like line voltage, ground wire resistance, chassis leakage, depending on, you know, if you have your, um, your device plugged into a wall um, or if it's battery powered, do think about that and, and the changes that it might have on your test procedure. Um, but again, consult the service manual. They'll tell you uh, which, which electrical safety requirements you need to follow. Um, the third is, is the preventive maintenance procedure itself or the PM procedure. Um, so that's where you're actually going to do the cleaning, uh, the testing. You're going to make sure that it's operational. Um, and then you're going to do any uh, brand and model specific preventive maintenance that's required on that time-based schedule. Um, so that's the biggest, biggest chunk of your work. Um, and then once that, that's done, you're going to go into your performance testing. Um, so when you're doing uh, these, these types of testing, I talked about the flow, the volume, uh, occlusion, pressure, um, and alarm function, but there are other things you should try and think about as well. Um, and the first one there, pull clamp function, right? Is, is the clamp working as it should? Um, but yeah, like Jerry said, in terms of what goes wrong, do make sure that you're doing a complete uh, performance test here to make sure that your flow pressures, volumes, your occlusions, your alarms, all of that is working. And like I said, that's defined um, in the service manual um, as a great place to start. Um, do think about uh, your measurements, right? Do document your uh, results. And the other thing is do think about the metrology behind it. Are you using uh, test equipment um, that you can rely on to give you accurate results? And does your test equipment allow you to do all of the performance testing that's required of you? Um, so yeah, as we look at this, this performance testing part, that's kind of where we're gonna uh, double click um, for the rest of the presentation um, because that's kind of where um, Fluke Biomedical plays um, and we'll kind of walk through how you can streamline your, your procedure here. Um, so with that, wanted to move on to the next poll question. Uh, so if we could tee that one up, um, do you have to use only the test instrument that the manufacturer recommends? Yes or no? So this is a simple one we'll throw out there. We're curious to see where the answers take us. Mm, yes, indeed. <laughs> All righty, responses are coming in. Let me give attendees about another 20 seconds to enter their response. And the poll is now closing. I'll share the results. 
And so there we go. Let's see, 36% indicated yes, 64% indicated no. Again, very interesting responses, but um, understandable given what manufacturers of the infusion pumps are saying, what their distributors and representatives are saying to you um, about their infusion device. And uh, the actual answer is no. You don't have to use only the test instrument the manufacturer recommends. And I don't know why this says yes, but the answer is no. And here's the big conundrum, the big question. If the manufacturer says you need to use a beaker and a scale, which measures the weight by volume of the fluid that goes into the beaker, then they're going to ask for the, the results of the measurement to be in grams. That's a mass measurement, grams. However, you need to understand that in uh, the reason that we test with uh, sterile water is that the um, one milliliter by volume of sterile water is equal to one gram of sterile water. That is the chemistry under underpinning the measurements that we'll make. So your test fluid will always be sterile water. Um, and um, you may report, therefore, the results either as milliliters or as grams, as required by whatever the manufacturers, how are the manufacturers requiring you report. So CareFusion, for example, has a software that they want you to use that is driving the test procedure step by step. And when they get to the flow volume tests, they want you to use a beaker and a scale to get the volume in grams, and they will get you to use a stopwatch to uh, identify how what is the flow rate um, over the, the infusion time. So um, there are some difficulties though with beakers and scales, just as there are with graduated burettes. Every test uh, device has its strengths and weaknesses. And so Mike, you were gonna go through some of these. Yeah, I mean, if, if we start on the left with the graduated burette, um, you're basing it off of you know, the human eye. Um, and the other thing is you're basing it off of the lines on the graduated burette. Um, so you're approximating at any given moment where that meniscus is. Um, you know, is it at the line? Is it below the line? Is it in between the lines? Um, so it, it is a little bit of a form of guessing. Um, and guessing in this case just isn't good enough. Um, it is very, you know, easy to use. Um, it's very easy to get a grasp of, um, but at the same time, you know, there is the potential for error. Um, and the thing is, you know, in this area, when it comes to patient safety, you really just don't want those errors. Um, the, and the other thing is it takes time, right? So you're gonna have to set up uh, your graduated burette between every single uh, unit. You're gonna have to make sure that it's dry, that there's no residual fluid in there because that will skew your test results. Um, and ultimately, it will only uh, test part of your, your test, right? So when we're doing these volume flow tests, um, you're still gonna need something else to do pressure because your graduated burette's not going to do that. Well, um, and you'll need a stopwatch again in order to get the flow rate because there's no other way to, you have to, you have to time it out. That's right, and that's one more piece of equipment to carry. Exactly. Um, so, you know, similarly with, with beaker and scale, right? Um, this is when you're gonna take a beaker, you're similarly gonna fill it up with uh, fluid over time, uh, and then you're gonna weigh it. So to Jerry's point, one milliliter equals one gram. Um, that, that's where he's really talking about that. And, you know, manufacturers do say that you, you need to do this, right? And that you need to do it in grams, um, but do, I do want to stress that point that if you're using water, one gram is one milliliter. Um, so all things are equal in that case. Still need a stopwatch here, 
Um, but you still have all those uh, pain points in terms of residual volume. Uh, you still have you know, human error um, because you didn't clean it enough. Um, you're not relying on eyesight as much anymore, right? You're relying on weight, um, but you still need additional test equipment to do your complete preventive maintenance. There's um, no there's no argument that scales are are accurate. They definitely are. They're a laboratory type testing device. But as a laboratory type testing device, they don't travel well. So if you're a traveling biomed, or even if you need to go from one place in the hospital to another, you have to be really careful and gentle with that scale, otherwise you're going to throw it out of calibration. So they don't travel well. So that's also part of a problem if you need to go to many different locations to do the testing on infusion devices. Right, and, and that brings us to the last point on the electronic analyzer. Um, you know, it is something that takes all the great parts uh, of these other uh, test methods, right? Um, but, you know, it does reduce that human error aspect. It does take some of the time aspect away, so you're able to test faster. It does standardize how you're doing that testing. Um, so ultimately, it, it increases your productivity. Um, the downsides to an electronic analyzer are it's more complex than a graduated burette or a beaker in scale. Um, you know, there still can be some residual volume. Um, so there still is that cleanup aspect and, and there is an increased cost. Um, but again, when you use an analyzer like this, um, you know, and you, you take care of it, you use pure distilled water or micro 90, um, you get those accurate results. You have a long longevity of your, your test device. Uh, and you're really able to take away a lot of those downsides to um, the other pieces. You don't need that stopwatch, right? You don't need an extra piece of equipment uh, and you've, you've reduced your error and increased your accuracy. So there are definitely some um, advantages there. Um, but Jerry, is there anything, you know, when someone's performing their volume flow test, anything in terms of test setup that they should look out for? Mostly we've covered the base there. The other, the, the, there, there's additional things about pressure, measuring pressure. The, the one thing about the electronic analyzer that the other two methods don't give you is the ability to continuously measure the back pressure uh, on, the, on the test instrument, which would be the back pressure felt by the patient because of things um, uh, in, uh, because of the way that the fluid is being delivered to them, including that downstream occlusion. But even ongoing during the, the flow volume delivery, back pressure is important to make sure that, um, that we're not going to do damage or under deliver the, the flow rate and volume therefore to the patient. No, absolutely. And, and, you know, we talk about graduated burettes and beaker and scales. Um, there's, there's other, you know, OEMs out there that do require some proprietary, further proprietary equipment, um, like strain gauges um, or... Well, strain gauges know. are about pressure. That's the only thing a strain gauge can measure. Right. So, and that, that's why I'm just, I'm calling that out as, before, as we move to the pressure measurement methods um, that, you know, there are proprietary test devices out there, um, but trying to minimize how much you need to test with is uh, is a big, big thing you should focus on. So with that, as we move to pressure measurement, um, there are, there's a similar uh, kind of split here where you have um, an analog gauge or a digital pressure meter. Um, so if we look at the, the analog gauge, um, it, they're good, right? But overall, um, you can uh, measure, you can kind of ruin your test equipment, right? Because they're not uh, fully designed to do liquid measurements, right? So if you do pick one, do make sure that it is uh, a liquid measurement analog gauge, um, but do know that they can degrade over time. Um, the other thing is a digital pressure meter, right? If you do go for, to go down that route, you need to make sure there's always an air cavity between uh, the fluid that you're measuring the pressure on and the, the pressure meter. 
um, if you do get fluid into your digital pressure meter, it can ruin uh, the technology there as well. Um, it's also important to note that because there's an air barrier there, um, note that air is compressible, right? So as that air compresses and the, and the, the liquid doesn't, um, it can skew your readings by a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So do note that, you know, there are um, some drawbacks to that, um, you know, and those those are acceptable to measure pressure, um, but just just do note those those negative aspects of it. Um, on the electronic side, you know, you are it is designed to measure fluid flow, fluid pressure, and fluid volume, right? So um, it is specifically designed for the task at hand, um, and it does uh, you know provide a lot of those advantages that we talked about um, on the last slide in terms of error reduction and test time reduction. Um, and it gives you the ability to to automate it. Um, so do do think about those as you uh, make your test equipment selections. Um, and Jerry, before we move on, I, I know you had an, an interesting example that might be good to yeah, share about so in, the in, uh, arrangement of stuff. Yes, the, in in the video that that we have on the in the video library from our uh, in on our website. Um, that was, uh, we have an infusion device testing video that was done by a, a good colleague of ours, Justin Ross, um, and he was pointing out something very important that you may not consider, and especially if you did not have gas or fluid physics in your in in your learning as part of your academic training, and that is this the test instrument that you use to measure flow and volume and pressure needs to be at the same level as your infusion device. If your infusion device is higher than your test instrument, there will be a higher pressure exerted on the test instrument and it can throw your readings off both, both for volume as well as for pressure. Likewise, if your infusion device is lower than your infusion device analyzer, your test instrument, then it will not exert appropriate pressure. So the pressure will be lower and therefore the flow and volumes can be can change as a result of that. So this leveling is really important just as when you do blood pressure measurements on a patient that the cuff uh, around their arm or the transducer for an invasive blood pressure be at the same level as the heart because you get the same changes in pressure action if the if the um, uh, if the cuff is uh, higher than the patient or lower than the patient's heart. So these are all really important, and you may not be thinking about these things, but they can change your measurements and cause errors because simply because you're not thinking about all of the technology points that are applicable. All right, so with that, let's hand it back over to Jerry and uh, maybe we can talk about how we're gonna optimize our test strategy. Sure, so the first thing we wanna go through about optimizing um, and, and further streamlining your, your infusion test strategy is the evaluation of risk. And we talked about that already, and we're gonna reiterate it in a particular way so that you can understand how you might specifically go about evaluating your risk and determining how often you ought to be doing testing. Number two, we want to ensure that we are in compliance with the not only the international standard, but also the manufacturer's requirements for us in doing the testing and making sure that um, that we're getting the right measurements, the right testing methodology, and that we have the right testing limits. So we need to make sure that we are in compliance with that. And then saving time and reducing costs. So we're gonna go through all three of those things. All right, so let's talk a little bit about risk assessment. In our MDQA, uh, course series in advanced training uh, and from our textbook, uh, Medical Equipment Quality Assurance Program Development and Testing Procedures, um, we teach you a way to do a risk assessment. And this was used by the University of Vermont here in the United States. And it works really, really well. 
Um, I'm not going to go through it in great detail here. I refer you to the MDQA course series in Advantage Training, so make sure you register for that, get access to it, and go through the one, let's say you're only in, interested in infusion testing, go through the one that's about infusion device testing because it's in there, it's one of the chapters. So there are five criteria. Each criteria has some choices. We make one choice out of the criteria that are available under each uh, uh, under each um, item, each of the five items. So we end up with a total risk score that we use to determine how often we should be testing the medical device, including infusion pumps, based on our experience and the experience of others uh, that come in from th places like the US FDA uh, incident reports and so forth to make sure that we have a clear understanding of how often that testing ought to be done and verify or have another way to compare what the manufacturer is saying compared to what is our own experience with infusion devices in our inventory or in the inventory of our client sites if we're an independent service organization. Basically, it should come out uh, aside from those uh, pumps that are delivering chemotherapy or, or opioids or things like that, they should come out to once per year, which is what all the manufacturers are recommending for infusion device testing. But your experience may be different and it's okay. And if you need to test more frequently, that's what you should write in your policy and procedure about how and how often you're going to do your infusion device testing and why. That's your, your um, uh, justification for why you're going to test more often. Okay, so then we're going to ensure compliance. So here we're going to suggest that you consider some form of test automation. And test automation helps us with compliance in that it can help us streamline our test procedure and standardize the workflow step by step. So everybody does the testing the same way. That gives us statistical significance to our measurements and our test results that will can be used by the database to, um, to further help us understand reliability of the infusion devices in our inventory. It also can help us to reduce human error uh, because we will have at least predetermined test limits around any measurement that we need to make and um, uh, a way to document any visual inspection or other things that need to be done in preventive maintenance. It helps us ensure regulatory compliance because we have the right documentation that helps us with audit trail when the, um, the state health inspectors come or the US FDA health inspectors come or whoever is accrediting your medical facility. So in the United States, it would be a joint commission or it would be a DNA, a DNV, I'm sorry, DNV. Um, and there may be one other that, that is doing uh, audit trail uh, compliance and, and accrediting your facility. The government in the United States looks to that accreditation to reimburse the cost of care for patients that are receiving infusion, for example. We're going to create electronic archives of all our testing, including preventive maintenance and repair records, for easy review and for easy retrieval so that we can analyze it uh, properly. It also aids in traceability, which is part of our why, why metrology is important uh, course courses in Advantage Training and in our webinar series. The data extraction offers trending analysis in the database, the computerized maintenance management system, which is a much more powerful computer than your laptop or your phone or your tablet. And in that case, we're looking for failure rate trending. What were the failures? What were the categories of failures? And how are they trending over time? And then we can set trending limits that help us understand if, when and how we need to adjust our testing procedure. 
and how we need to be reporting on those things to the manufacturer and back through to the US FDA if the device is sold for use here in the US or ministries of health in other countries. So all of these things can be helped by even onboard automation of infusion device testers. Um, so you're gonna to wanna to take a look at that. Also for saving time and cost, reducing cost, remember that we said, especially in the United States and Western Europe and in some other parts of the world, infusion devices are among the most uh, uh, most frequently used with patients. So they're gonna show up in big numbers. So you need to be able to be efficient in running these tests. So we can create a automated workflow, a, a uh, workflow automation, if you will, that covers every single thing that needs to be done from in visual inspection to electrical safety to preventive maintenance and to those performance tests that need to be done and document it all in an appropriate way. And when we apply both interoperability on the front end with our the software to our test instrument and on the back end to our CMMS database, we're able to seamlessly get the right test procedure for the brand and model of infusion device, for example, that we need to test and send the information to that database to help us close work assignments automatically if it's a pass. Why should you have to go and close the work assignment if it passed the test? Let that automatically happen and that backend interoperability helps drive that. Or to take the failed tests and send that failed information into the database so it can create automatically a corrective action work assignment that can be followed up on. So you, you have the two join, the, the test procedure. If it failed, you have a corrective action work assignment followed by a repeat of the test procedure to get to that pass. And now you have thoroughly documented it. You've driven compliance you've run an efficient test that may take less time than you trying to do it manually and document on pen and paper and come back at the end of the day with a whole bunch of test results to try and remember how to properly record those in your database. Oh my gosh. We can take care of all of that. And remember also the test instrument that you use can help you save time also. In this case, we're showing our IDA5, which can be up to a four channel test instrument. It can test four individual one channel infusion devices rather at the same time, or it can test one multiple channel infusion, one or two multiple channel infusion devices in approximately the same time. So you can see, if you're only testing one channel at a time, that takes you 22 minutes to do. If you can multiply that by batch testing, in that same 22 minutes, you've tested four infusion device channels or four infusion pumps. That saves time. It helps reduce the cost of ownership and the, and the cost uh, of doing the testing. You get through it faster. When you couple that with automated workflows, so everybody does it the same way, you get great compliance. And that's what we get when we use things like our new OneQA software, workflow automation. And we can set up tests, procedures, uh, workflows that don't really, it doesn't really matter whether you have an interoperable test instrument or anything else that you're using, including that graduated uh, uh, Burette and, and stopwatch, you can still get an efficient test and it documents it in a standardized way and helps you solve all those other problems and it makes it easier for you to do your work and get it done quickly. All right. Well, I know we gave you guys a lot of information, but with that, we just wanna thank you all for attending um, and we'll move on to some Q and A if you guys have some questions. Dan, anything that's come in? Great, thank you, Jerry and Mike. Um, yes, a couple questions have come in, and um, I know we have about 
five, six minutes left, so we'll try to get as much as we can. And I want to remind you, do send your questions in and we'll email your responses to you. But uh, one of the questions was, what are the maximum number of tests that the IDA5 can store internally? This one came in a little earlier and Dan and, and, uh, and I were able to look it up because I didn't remember, but the IDA5 can store 250 tests and 200 uh, onboard automated test templates uh, to help with onboard automation guiding. So um, that's gonna be more than enough to get you through most work days and then you're gonna upload those test results into your database one way or another. Perfect, thank you, Jerry. Another question here, What what is the acceptable deviation limit for both syringe pump and infusion pumps? They're different between the two infusion devices and the best answer is always going to come from the manufacturer's brand and model specific service manual test procedure or failing that from the international standard itself which specifies the testing methodology and the testing limits so rather than us trying to tell you what that is i recommend you go to the source of the information perfect thank you jerry and then we have another question we have a, a person on the line here that's using a beaker and scale now but they're wondering how they can, I, th I think you answered this in the slide before this, uh, about batch testing with the IDA on, on how you do that. Well, it's a little harder. So let's just use Carefusion as an example and their software. Um, I am told, and I don't know this from my own experience, but I am told that you can only run a single instance of that software on your computer at any one time which means that you are limited to a workflow that will test one infusion device channel at a time. In that case, the IDA5 is able to help you because again, it's gonna make its measurements in uh, volume measurements in milliliters, but remember that you're using sterile water and therefore your chemistry says that one milliliter equals one gram. So you take your test result to, to display it on your IDA5 for volume, and you would enter it as grams uh, on that software. So I hope that helps answer that question. Perfect, thank you, Jerry. Well, that, that about does it. I, I have no other questions coming in right now. Um, again, this this, Webinar has been recorded, so it'll be available to you um, online after this. But um, with that, we'll go ahead and close it up. Thank you again, everyone, for joining today, and I appreciate your engagement. Thanks, everyone.